This is the first lecture in the course Biblical Ethics. I'm Dr. Roland Grams, and our subject in this lecture is What is Biblical Ethics? We might begin with the question more broadly asked, What is ethics? And here I want to make a point that some perspectives on this have point to a more universal understanding of ethics. It's ethics that everyone should subscribe to. On the other hand, there is the more particular local uh, ethic of a particular community. So on the universal side, we might go back to 1920 and have a look at a philosophical introduction to ethics by George Alexander Johnson an introduction to ethics for training colleges. He writes, Everything, then, that man does is done because it is conceived to have a value for life. And this is a value for human life. Every action and judgment has some relation to man and has some reference to what is good for man. But what is the good for man? The question, what that good is, is the question that ethics asks and tries to answer. What is the good of human life? What is the aim of human life? And what is man's chief end? Well, there we have it, the questions asked uh, regarding ethics in very broad categories. It's not going to matter whether you live in North America or Africa or Asia. It's not going to matter if you live in the first century or the 21st century. It's not going to matter uh, whether you are a Christian, a Buddhist, or some other uh, description. You're asking questions, rather, about what is the good for human life. Over against that is uh, another approach to ethics that is more communitarian. And I've actually used the word emphasis here because uh, just because you're communitarian in your ethics doesn't mean that you can't make claims about universality. And so uh, there is not, not necessarily an exclusivity here as we introduce these different approaches. But here, ethics is the exploration of what, why, and how a people are, what they are, and do what they do. Christian ethics is the exploration then of what why and how followers of Jesus Christ are, how they are, who they are, what they are, and what, why they do what they do. Now, the distinctions between approaches to ethics is one that we're going to emphasize at the beginning here. But first of all, I make a simple observation that if you walk into some of the remaining bookstores today, like Barnes & Noble, you will not find a section on ethics. And yet, in the uh, Greco-Roman period, ethics would have been one of the primary topics that you would discuss. And certainly in uh, subsequent history, ethics was extremely important. Instead, we find self-help sections or fiction sections and uh, there's a small philosophical section that seems to be a hodgepodge of who knows what, but it's popular reading that sells. And uh, in the religious section, there are very few good books. It's, uh, a, it's a strange marketplace in a bookstore, but ethics is uh, fairly lacking. Now, we can find books on ethics, and you might find them at some online resource that has a much larger selection of books. Uh, one example might be, for philosophical ethics, James Rachel's book, The Elements of Moral Philosophy. A, a different approach, then, that's more communitarian, that's more particular, would, of course, be on theological ethics. Now, traditionally, uh, many of the thinkers in ethics and philosophy in the West uh, in the past 2,000 years have been Christians. And so the distinction between philosophical and theological ethics has often been blurred. The more we live in an age where Christianity is separated from the culture, uh, the more we can see the distinction applying. Christians do things differently from other people. And so we can talk more specifically about theological ethics. But even the appropriation of 
the philosophical ethics of the Greco-Roman world by the Christian authors in Europe involved uh, a change where the importance of God and God's existence uh, and the importance of his word in scripture made a huge difference from what was said in philosophical ethics. If you look at Thomas Aquinas's work on ethics, it is a combination of Aristotle and also of Christian thinking. He can talk about the philosophical cardinal virtues and he can also talk about the um, ecclesial virtues of faith, hope, and love. Now, a good book on theological ethics is by Stanley Grintz, uh, The Moral Quest, Foundations of Christian Ethics. And in that book, he also has some discussion of philosophical ethics. Over against these two approaches, there is then biblical ethics. And we're going to look some more at the distinctions between these. But for this slide, I'd like to point out two books out of the many books that have been written uh, of some significance. One is by Chris Wright, The Old Testament Ethics for the People of God. And another is uh, by Richard Hayes, The Moral Vision of the New Testament, A Contemporary Introduction to New Testament Ethics. Now note the dates on both of these books, 2004 and 1996. Uh, there are some areas in biblical studies where dates like that would say, well, we're definitely outdated in terms of current literature. And yet in the field of biblical ethics, books tend to hang around a bit longer. And these are still two uh, very worthwhile resources, even though others have been written since. And uh, sometimes more particular focus uh, on a specific ethical issue is uh, uh, current and, and more updated. But these are the general topics of Old and New Testament ethics. What I would like to do is to move to a distinction between theological and philosophical ethics as presented by Donald Blesch in a book that he wrote called Freedom for Obedience back in 1987. And the next few uh, slides will offer a table uh, presentation, a tabular presentation of some of the points he makes in distinction between these. I want to run through this as quickly as I can because the main point is to say that theological and philosophical ethics are different. Some of the particulars are ones you can reflect on um, in, in beyond what time is given to the lecture here per se. So a difference between theological and philosophical ethics might begin with talking about the major question. How shall we be disciples of Jesus Christ is a very different question from asking simply, what is the good? You can see the theological is going to focus on the authority of scripture, uh, on our understanding of the triune God, a focus on Jesus Christ, our Christology. This is all very different from very universalistic considerations about what is the good for humankind. And that's the next question, what is the good? The good in theological circles might be defined through God's definitive revelation. The good is understood concretely in the person of Jesus Christ. Whereas on the philosophical side, it's defined in light of a general metaphysical or worldview. The good is some abstract notion. The center in theological ethics then would be God, it would be God-centered and, and Christ-centered, theocentric and Christocentric, whereas in philosophical discussions, it's anthropocentric. It's, uh, the focus is on who we are as human beings, what is the human condition, and how do we live in it. Uh, the possibilities for residents uh, uh, in, in the uh, human world. Authority is also different for the two approaches. Uh, the authority of God's word is not something that the philosophical traditions will entertain unless it's Christian philosophy. And in that regard, we're moving into the direction of theology. But God's word uh, for us will uh, be a, a personal direction for our lives and for how we are to uh, 
live and love in the world. Whereas on the philosophical side, the authority will be some kind of reason. Now this is one of the discussions in Western Enlightenment thinking about whether reason is autonomous or whether reason belongs to a certain tradition. And a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers or the, the Enlightenment thinkers were after some kind of autonomous reason as an authority uh, for universal moral law. The starting point in theological ethics would be the indicative or the fact of God's grace. It has priority over the imperatives of how we should live, our ethics. On the philosophical side, ethics would be derived from principles. So we ask, what are the principles by which we should live? And if we can get the right principles down, then we can identify um, what we should do in particular ethics. I will pause on this point and uh, note some uh, major perspectives in Western ethics on the philosophical side. Uh, Immanuel Kant suggested that we should live by the principle that what we claim to be ethical should be uh, ethical for everybody. It's the universal principle. It's uh, the categorical imperative that um, what's right for me is right for everyone. Therefore, for example, we should say that everyone should always tell the truth, and therefore I should tell the truth. We can't say, look, I should tell the truth, but other people don't have to. Uh, if it's something that you should do, it should be universalizable. universalizable. And that's Immanuel Kant's approach. Over against that, the utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill said that the good is to be defined as the great, doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. You can hear the utilitarian aspect of that. Do the greatest good to the greatest number of people. Uh, this um, is uh, often seen in making decisions about limited resources. What should we do? Uh, in a crisis situation, will you do the greatest good for the greatest number of people? Over against that, then, um, is a viewpoint that arose in the 1950s and 60s for situation ethics that said, look, we're not going to drill down and say what you should do. The principle is going to be as broad and general as possible so that the situation can determine what you should do. So the principle is do the loving thing. And you will know what the loving thing to do is in a given situation. I'm not going to tell you what it is. So these three broad approaches to ethics have been around in the West. What I want to emphasize here is that in this enlightenment history of Western ethics, the name of the game was to come up with a principle by which you could live. It would be your starting point, and then you can derive ethics from that. You can talk about truth-telling once you get down to what the principle is that's going to define that. That is extremely different from uh, ethics that's going to be um, very full, like uh, Old Testament ethics with many laws and uh, related to a particular people. Uh, very contextual. And uh, so uh, what we end up with is a huge uh, contrast between the emergent uh, approach to ethics since the, since the 1700s, the 18th century, when the Enlightenment begins in the West, and a biblical theological ethics that says this is what we should do in a much more particular way. Let's move on with Blesch, though. Blesch further talks about the difference on ethical dialogue. For the theological um, approaches, ethical dialogue will speak of graces, ways by which the Spirit of God is manifested in our actions. Philosophical ethics will speak of virtues, the realization of human potentialities. How can we develop uh, 
over time virtues of ha habits that become virtues as opposed to habits that are vices. The relation to culture for theologians has to do with the good person often breaking with the culture and even the religious establishment to live ethically. Whereas on the philosophical side, the relation to culture might be more positive. The good person will be a person that can live well as a good citizen. Motivations are also different. For theologians, motivations will have to do with the glory of God and zeal for God's honor and glory or love of neighbor and fear of God and gratefulness for God's grace or a desire for one's own salvation will motivate us to live ethically. On the philosophical side, our motivation might be advancement or fulfillment of ourselves, of our own potentials as human beings. Or they might have to do with the definition of social values such as justice, duty, and honor, as opposed to love and humility, for example. The tragic flaw for human beings is a great dividing point between th theology and philosophy. Sin is the tragic flaw on the theological side. It's our revolt against God's will. Whereas on the philosophical side, all kinds of other options have been presented by different philosophers. For Plato, it was ignorance. What we needed was remembrance or knowledge. And uh, for Sophocles, it was uh, fate, our place in history, uh, determines so much about who we are, and it limits us. For the Gnostics and the Manichaeans, uh, the tragic flaw was our animal or material nature. For Buddhists, uh, the tragic flaw might be desire, which needs to be extinguished. Or for Hindus, Bud Buddhists, and uh, theophysy, uh, it may be that we accumulate a karma in our pre-existent state that plays out in our current present state. Or for Plato or Alfred North Whitehead, it might have to do with the inertia of nature. For Karl Marx, it would be the oppressive character of social institutions. For the Greek tragedians, it would have to do with pride or hubris or our immoderation. And for Friedrich Nietzsche or the Marquis de Sade, it might be cultural and religious taboos. By a long list like this, uh, I intend to suggest that one way in which to engage conversation uh, ethic ethically in the world is to explore how people uh, understand the tragic flaw uh, that people face and contrast that with our Christian understanding of based in scripture on what the tragic flaw is. The ground for ethical action for theologians is the free grace of God revealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is a grace to the undeserving. Whereas on the philosophical side, the ground for ethical action may have to do with our will or power or human freedom or our rational or mystical insights. The goals in ethics for theologians may have to do with things like the glory of God, the advance, advancement of God's kingdom. It may have to do with uh, our holiness and sanctification or the mission that we're pursuing and how that relates to uh, ethics. For Roman Catholics, uh, the focus may be on beholding God's glory. Now, this is something that goes right back um, to Middle Platonism even, the beatific vision, and uh, that was understood in the Middle Ages as beholding God's glory. Or for evangelicals, the goal in ethics may be described in terms of conformity to God's will. Philip Spainer uh, said conformity to God's will, regarding conformity to God's will, he said, next to God's glory, my great object is that God shall save my soul and those whom he has entrusted to me. Now, there are some subordinate goals we might list as well, and you can see how complicated then ethics becomes in a particular person's uh, theological 
uh, arguments. Uh, it might have to do with perfect love or fellowship of the saints or social holiness or extension of the kingdom or glorification. Uh, the goal is not happiness or well-being, but holiness. Holiness might lead to a very unhappy life in a particular culture and context. Whereas in the philosophical side, the question becomes, well, what is happiness? What is pleasure? And that's going to be described differently in different philosophical traditions. For Epicurus and the Epicureans, uh, happiness was dis described in terms of an ideal of ataraxia, the state of repose and equilibrium undisturbed by the agitations of life. Don't be disturbed by the fact that gods exist because they have no impact on your life. You might as well live as if gods didn't exist. And if you are going to live with the fear about gods in your life, then you're going to be disturbed and agitated. Similarly, don't worry about death. Uh, so that's uh, just a quick picture on Epicurus. There, we might also talk about utilitarianism to jump to the end of the 1700s and beginning of the 1800s, where well-being uh, may be the goal of the utilitarians, uh, described in terms of the greatest good to the greatest number of people. For philosophical humanism, not gratification of senses, but fulfillment of human potentiality is, is the goal. And for Aristotle, virtue alone cannot guarantee happiness or pleasure or well-being. There must be a good ordering of the virtues. You need to know where the key virtues are and how they define the other virtues. You need to be able to define the virtues in order to understand what um, pleasure is. And underlying all of that is the virtues for a particular community, like being a good citizens of, citizen of Athens. How are you going to live well there? For Stoics, eudaimonia lies in what they called apatheia, where we get the word apathy. Uh, it has to do with the complete control of one's passions, the peace of mind and independent from circumstances. So you're born a slave, be a slave, but don't let your slavery uh, control you because that's an incidental matter, accidental. It is not something that defines who you are. So live um, with um, independence from the fact that you're a slave or a wealthy man or an emperor or whatever. That's mere accidents of existence. For Confucius, the goal in ethics is social harmony. For Immanuel Kant, eternal peace. For Karl Marx, social justice and equality. For Eric Fromm, humanization for Buddhists, equanimity, emotionally neutral, detached, disinterested existence. For uh, Friedrich Schopenhauer, nothingness. For Gnostics, knowledge. For Plotinus, a reunion of the soul with the ground of being. And in Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard suggested survival as the goal. A great variety of options. As we look at philosophical ethics, I want to say a few things about the uh, classical period of Greece and uh, begin with a word about sophists. The language for ethics used by Greek sophists suggests that ethics is understood by them as both cultural um, related to a particular community and universal for all hum human beings. And th that is one of the discussions that they have about ethics. Is it universal or is it particular? Uh, virtue is one of the things that they focus on. Uh, the Greek word is arete. And a virtue is described as what makes a person or thing function well. The example often used is a knife. What makes a knife function well? And one virtue that can help a knife function well is sharpness, for example, if we're to apply the language uh, to knives. Uh, 
So we can talk then about people. What makes people function well to reach the good that has been determined by a particular philosophical school? So how do we live well? And in a few slides from now, I'll mention a few of the virtues that Aristotle suggests and show how he comes up with them. But we need to ask first what the end is, what the goal is. Function well at what? Uh, at public forums? Well, for that, we may need something like uh, sophistry, uh, the rhetorical skills, uh, which would have to do with a contextual emphasis regarding questions of what is right and just in this particular situation. Uh, so the training that sophists offered had to do with public speech in forums, in the assembly, in the law courts. Give us your youth and we will train them up to argue any point, whether it's on the positive side or the negative side. And so sophistry becomes associated with this uh, relativism uh, and also with the rhetoric that didn't have to do with um, an absolute ethic, but rather um, with particular ethics because you argue whatever you want to. Protagoras uh, says, man is the measure of all things. You can see the relativism here. Uh, of the things which are that they are, and of the things which are not that they are not. So for example, what is hot for one person is cold for another person. And then applying this to ethics, uh, whatever in any city is regarded as just and admirable is just and admirable, admirable in that city for so long as it is thought to be so. So it's very relativistic. Uh, sophists also talked about ethics in terms of a craft or techne. You can see our word technology comes from here. The skill that we gain to develop in order to function well. You see, if virtue is that thing that you need to function well, well, then the learning a craft or is also uh, learning skills to function well. For sophists, then this meant the craft of rhetoric. Uh, two other terms I want to introduce from the sophists are phusis and nomos. Phusis, we get our word physics from that. Nomos is often translated as law. But together and in contrast to another, e each other, the words have to do with nature, phusis, and convention, nomos. You can see how law can be related to convention. What are laws but the codification of the conventions that a particular society has established? We will live by these laws. We have different laws in the UK from uh, the United States, uh, even though there might be a lot of overlap, but it, our laws are different because our conventions are different. And uh, that's quite different from saying, let's talk about nature, which has application to everybody, whether you're living in the UK or in the US. So one lives according to one's own purposes. One who lives according to one's own purposes lives according to nature. One who lives according to standards in a given city lives according to convention. To live by nature means to be pre-moral or non-moral, and such a person will typically be aggressive and lustful. The argument goes among the sophists. Now, that's going to be quite different from what the um, Stoics will say about this distinction and other philosophers as well. So we'll move on. And we move on to Plato. Uh, much can be said about Plato. What I want to do is to present the idea of cardinal virtues with respect to Plato. And in particular, I have in view his important work, The Republic. The Republic explores how to set up a society with respect to the cardinal virtues. 
And the cardinal virtues for the Greeks were courage, wisdom, temperance, and justice. Other virtues would relate to the cardinal or primary virtues. You understand other virtues in relationship to these cardinal virtues. Remember I said earlier that for Aristotle it's important that you have the right ordering of virtues. And part of the right ordering of virtues has to do with understanding what the cardinal virtues are. Contrast the cardinal virtues here with uh, cardinal virtues for contemporary American society. Certainly we put freedom uh, as one of those cardinal virtues. Now that will change your whole ethical system if you put freedom uh, there. And so um, this is the point about what the cardinal virtues are. The cardinal virtues might be thought of in terms of uh, the body. The head would have to do with wisdom. The chest or heart would have to do with courage. And the stomach would have to do with desire. And therefore, the cardinal virtue that would regulate desire would be temperance. And then justice is the right ordering of the virtues. So it's important for the Greeks that you're not controlled by your desires um, or that you're not controlled by your um, courage, but you should be controlled by wisdom. And that right ordering then will bring justice to society. So in Plato's book, The Republic, the ruler, the ruling class need to be the philosopher kings that he calls the guardians. You see that in column three here for wisdom. Uh, the guardians are the philosopher kings. Now, you, you don't put in charge your auxiliary guardians who exemplify the virtue of courage. Those would be your military. Or you don't put um, the just the, the relationship between different classes um, as your key goal. Uh, that they're, they're, the different classes are equal and ri rightly regulated. No, you need, you need the guardians to rule the society, the republic. So just looking at this table a bit more, we can see uh, that there's a, the second column. We can talk about these virtues in terms of their social role or in the last column, the individual. The individual will, who shows courage will be uh, developing his or her spirited part, whereas the person emphasizing wisdom will be developing the soul part of the body, the soul part of the human being. And the person developing temperance will be focused on the body. And you can see then that this relates to the Greek understanding of a tripartite anthropology or human being, where we're made up out of body, soul, and spirit, which is not really a biblical understanding of how to understand the human being. But it's definitely a, a Greek philosophical way of understanding the human being. And they relate, those parts re relate to the three virtues. The um, social side then relates to the individual and the structuring of society, the groups, re uh, relates to these cardinal virtues as well. So this produces a whole ethical system that's related to politics um, and also to our understanding of individual human beings. It's a, it's a very full-blown philosophical system. Aristotle, the pupil of Plato continued in many ways to say what was in the tradition that had been developed by Socrates and Plato and uh, before him. But uh, I want to say a few particular things about his approach to ethics. One is that he says different pursuits, different studies um, 
are can be differentiated because of their ends. So there are many ends, and we have to find out what the end or the goal in ethics is. He says, now, as there are many actions, arts, and sciences, their ends are also many. The end of the medical art is health. So what, what's the purpose of pursuing a study of medicine? It, it, it's uh, health. Uh, that of shipbuilding is to produce a vessel. That of strategy, victory. And that of economics, wealth. So then what is the goal or end for ethics? All knowledge and every pursuit aims at some kind of good. So then we are going to define the goal in terms of the good. And the good is for ethics is the, the highest good is eudaimonia, he wasn't the first one to say that. It is well-being and happiness. But then you have to ask, well, is this eudaimonia pleasure? You're enjoying life. You're living life at the beach. Or is it the pursuit of honor? Or is it the pursuit of virtue? And the answer is virtue. And that then leads him in the rest of book one and, and in all the way to the end of book seven out of ten books of his Nicomachean Ethics, to explore what the virtues are. So Aristotle's ethics focuses on the virtues. Once he's defined the end, he can talk about what virtues will get us there. What are the characteristics needed to, to do well toward that end? And so he accepts the cardinal virtues as wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Uh, but then he has a lengthy discussion of the particular virtues. And he, his contribution is to say that virtues are the mean, that's the middle, between two extremes. And the, those extremes are vices. Uh, the extreme of too little deficiency or too much excess. And we can see this in the table on the next slide. Here we have a few of the virtues that Aristotle notes in his Nicomachean Ethics. You can see on the first column and the third column the deficiency and excess, whereas in the middle we have the virtue. So, for example, bravery is the virtue that exists between cowardice and, we could say, overconfidence. So we're going to define bravery in terms of deficiency and excess. It's the middle. Or temperance is that middle place between too, pursuing too little pleasure in life or too much pleasure in life, intemperance or gluttony. Generosity, uh, too little of it. We're going to use the word ungenerosity here. That doesn't sound like a good English word. And one of the points that Aristotle makes, and we need to make as translators of Aristotle's work, is that uh, different languages don't always have a word for the things that we're looking for here. Um, so we have to use several words or make up words. But the idea is it's too little or too much. And so too much of generosity is wastefulness, just giving things away. And then uh, another example later on um, to jump down to in his discussion, uh, magnanimity is a virtue where people are concerned with great things, with honor. It's, this is a good characteristic. Now, if, you're, if you have an excess of that, then you can be pursuing vanity. Uh, you're, you're too self-possessed. You're too concerned with your own greatness in society. The deficiency of this is interesting. Uh, we might use the word being pusillanimous or one who thinks him or herself unworthy. Um, but this seems to be related to the idea of humility. And here we can see a really interesting difference between an Aristotelian approach to ethics and a Christian approach to ethics. Uh, magnanimity isn't the virtue for Christian ethics, but humility is. Because we understand humility to be a virtue that develops from Christ's death on the cross. Have this way of thinking among you. Um, have the mind of Christ. 
Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. And then he describes Christ's uh, not considering equality with God to be grasped or grasping or holding on to things for himself, but instead of emptying himself and taking on the form of humanity and submitting to death on the cross, this should be the mind of the community of Christ, the community at Philippi, uh, Paul says. And so we have something that Aristotle might have considered a vice being lifted up as a virtue in the Christian understanding of ethics that's based on the story of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And so then we do move on to talk about biblical and Christian ethics. And more briefly, I want to distinguish these and uh, bring the lecture to a close. Christian ethics, then, is not philosophical ethics. We saw that with Donald Blesch. Um, is not theological ethics without also being biblical. Sometimes theological ethics is very philosophical, and to the extent that it is, I think we should criti cri criticize it because theological ethics does need to be biblically based and engage um, our understanding of what the Bible says is our authoritative word from God to his people. Christian ethics is the ethic of the Christian church. It is Christian, and it uh, takes us into a study of the history of the church, and so therefore Christian ethics needs to look at the last 2,000 years of history and what the church has taught on different things. Now, biblical ethics can be distinguished from Christian ethics, not because Christian ethics isn't biblical, but because the focus is narrowed. The focus in biblical ethics is, first of all, exegetical. We have particular texts in the Bible. We have 66 books in the Bible. And so our first task is exegesis, reading the passage, reading the text in its historical, literary, and cultural context. So if we read an ethical comment in uh, the scriptures, we want to ask, who is saying this? In what century? To what group? In what cultural context? The ancient Near East, the Greek and Roman world, Judaism of the Second Temple period. That's going to distinguish uh, biblical ethics from Christian ethics uh, because it's going to be more detailed in uh, looking at exegetical questions. Secondly, biblical ethics is canonical. Now, so is Christian ethics, but um, on the canonical side for biblical ethics, we want to ask the question, what is the unity and diversity within Scripture? Often Christian ethics will look at a topic like love and look at different passages throughout the Scripture on love. Whereas in biblical ethics, we want to say, well, was it Paul talking about love? And when Paul was talking about love in Romans chapter 13, what's the context of his discussion of love in Romans? And how does that compare to what he says about love in Galatians or in 1 Corinthians 13? And so that uh, use of the canon is going to be uh, more contextual as well. We want to know what the Old Testament says, what the prophets say, what the law says, what Paul says, what Jesus says, what the Gospels say, what John says, what Peter says. And we ask those kinds of questions as we use the canon in biblical ethics. And in so doing, then, we're open to the possibility that there is some unity and diversity within the canon. We don't expect to come up with one particular view of God's people and the use of violence in warfare on the biblical side because we're open to the possibility that warfare in the Old Testament for the people of Israel was different from the disciples of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Whereas in Christian ethics, the Bible would be used and engaged, but the point would be to come up with a single view um, on 
what Christians believe today about the use of violence in military warfare. I want to add, though, a third point about biblical ethics. As with Christian ethics being biblical, so biblical ethics must be Christian. And there's an interesting discussion of this at the, toward the end of Chris Wright's book, Old Testament Ethics for the People of God, where he asks, does it matter if the scholar is a Christian or not in doing biblical ethics? And his answer to that is yes, and he gives some examples of exactly why that does make a difference. But the biblical ethics isn't something that is just text-based, but it is also reader-based. It's Christians engaging with their authoritative text, the Bible, uh, in exploring um, what the Bible says for how we should live. So here it overlaps with Christian ethics. Again, it involves looking at how the church has read scripture ethically in its history. And I keep emphasizing that for both points here on, on this slide. We shouldn't just talk about what the Bible says and therefore what we believe. We need to look at the intervening uh, centuries and ask, and how has the church interpreted the Bible over the centuries on that particular issue? So, for example, on the issue of homosexuality, we want to look at what the Bible has said on the issue, but we also want to look at what the church has taught over the last 2,000 years. Finally, I'd like to suggest that biblical ethics is both communitarian and universal. On the communitarian side, the Bible is this authoritative book, uh, not some other book, and so therefore it narrows ethics down from the universal idea to a, a particular writing, the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, and when we look at specific words within the Bible, then we hear them as God's word. Our job then is to hear what it says. If God is speaking in it, it's not that we're uh, about the task of using the Bible for our own purposes. It's not as if the community, the church today, is authoritative over the Bible, but that the community lives under the authority of the Bible. And therefore, our, our role is to be interpreters of Scripture, to explore what it means. We talk about exegesis, hearing what the Bible itself says, not reading our meaning into the Bible, not making it perform tasks that, it, that are ours as opposed to uh, what it is conveying as God's Word. It speaks to us um, as God's Word. Uh, and uh, secondly, the Bible is the authoritative book for a particular community um, in this sense. And this is a sense that Chris Wright describes at the end of his book on Old Testament ethics in the people of God. He uh, notes a distinction between authority and claim. Someone may have the authority to shout, he says, uh, move back on the street. But then you have to ask, now, is the person authoritative? And if it's a policeman, you say, yes, that person has authority. But then you say, but, but is that person speaking to me? And we have to do this with biblical ethics as well. As we look at an Old Testament passage that might talk about the use of violence in warfare, in holy warfare, uh, we may see that as God's authoritative word speaking to a particular community at a particular time and try to understand how that uh, worked in that context. But that doesn't necessarily make a claim on me about being involved in holy war. Uh, in the 21st century as someone living in a different culture and context as well. Uh, what is the difference even between Old Testament and New Testament ethics uh, comes out when we look at this distinction between authority and claim. The Old Testament uh, understands the eating of certain foods as a moral issue. Uh, and it makes a claim, though, 
on the Israelites and not on the Gentiles who come into the church. A second aspect of the communitarian nature of biblical ethics is that we are looking at the canon, um, not just biblical texts, but now the whole Bible. The Bible is the church's book, just as it is God's word to the church. And so our job is to explore its unity and diversity in ethical teaching. We don't just want to take a verse and run with it, but we want to see what the whole counsel of God is on a particular subject. And uh, we do that by looking for unity and diversity as we engage in biblical ethics. Also, with respect to the canon, it is not an authority for unbelievers. And coming out of uh, centuries of Christendom, where the church has been considered part of Western culture, there is a tendency among many to think that the, the Bible ought to be an authority for Western culture or, or countries. Uh, but it isn't. Uh, it's not an authority for unbelievers. It is our book. It is the church's book. And we use this book as a light to shine to the world as to what God's uh, view is in ethics on things. But they don't live under its authority, and let's not imagine that they do. Now, while this way of thinking about things leads to a understanding biblical ethics as local and community and for a particular people, the church, uh, nevertheless, the Bible makes universal claims in ethics. And that comes from our belief in one God. Our belief in one God leads us to claim that what God says to his people is what he also says to everyone. God is not just the God of Israel. He's not just the God of the church, but he's the God of the nations. And one day, if we can think about Isaiah chapter 2, for example, the nations will stream to Zion to learn righteousness. And so this universal claim is also present in Scripture. The God of Creator uh, demands the same ethic um, of all peoples. And part of what it means to be the church is the gathering of the nations under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we don't bring our cultural diversity uh, with respect to ethics into the church, but we lay those distinctives down ethically and submit to the one true God who has revealed himself in his word to his people. And this then is a testimony to the world that one day they too will come and bow. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Uh, as Isaiah 45 says, that Yahweh is Lord. And as Philippians 2 says, that Jesus is Lord. So one day... Everyone will acknowledge that there is only one God and everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ bears uh, the divine identity of Yahweh and therefore there's only one way to God and that is through Jesus Christ. So this is a universal claim that we make in biblical ethics as well. And with that then we conclude the introduction to biblical ethics for this course.